this afternoon with uh, one or two of the main theme, themes of, uh, of today for us. It's about like, you know, bridging this gap between different uh, communities. How we can like uh, open up <coughs> the OSSC community towards like new ones. And uh, that's why also we invited you, uh, Philip. Okay. Thanks. And uh, and you will be like uh, presenting today uh, work on hypergraph QA and uh, with RDF stores, as I can see. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, please go ahead, Philip. Okay. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Um, okay. My name is Philip Coates. I'm um, one of the co-founders and directors of Semantic, in Semantic Integration Limited, um, which is a community all there. Um, we're based in London. We're a small um, spe oh, specialist consultancy around semantic web and linked data. Um, we advise um, and consult and provide implementation expertise for organizations. Um, so, um, the topic I'm going to talk about today, Hypergraph QL um, particularly, came out in response to um, some issues that were faced by one of our clients. And it's been something that we've been able to expand on a little bit um, well, for, for additional clients as well. Um, so a little bit of history about the thing. Um, the project started in, I think it was about 2017. It was early 2017, maybe late 2016. So it's not been going that long. Um, it's found a little bit of late because of uh, lack of resource. Uh, so we've kind of uh, run dry because there's only so much time that we can spend on an open source project. Um, so we're kind of quite keen to get input from the community at large to uh, assist where, where possible. Um, <coughs> but uh, let's see if I can make this work. Oh, there we go. Oops. There we go. Okay. Um, I know that uh, microservices are sort of slightly, you know, will make some people kind of wince a little bit um, from the uh, OSLC um, world. But it's, in this sense, we sort of really are, you know, this, this is kind of how the project started up. So we would have some uh, microservices which um, have been built by a client. Um, yep, they've, they've got, there's a whole bunch of um, sort of key points about microservices surrounding that, that one. Um, and a bit of an idea of how they might be sort of fitted together in a traditional form. Um, and some of the problems that people faced. Um, so for example, if you make a change to one microservice, you might make a change to the API layer, and that's kind of architecturally, it's a bit not great. Um, and if you have to do more changes, then it becomes much more of a headache. Um, similarly, if you're not careful, um, and this was something that was certainly happening with a particular client of ours, interdependencies started to emerge between their components, and that's again architecturally not a great thing because it leads to all sorts of kind of hiccups and headaches. Um, so just to address that, our clients had put in place GraphQL, um, which I don't know if everyone knows GraphQL. Um, it's a graph query language, well no it's not a graph query language actually, it's called GraphQL but it's not a graph query language um, in a sort of perverse way. Um, it was built by Facebook um, as an internal project initially, and then they open sourced it, and it's become quite a popular thing with um, well, quite a popular thing with front-end developers, particularly um, moving on to who move, moving on to things like Node and stuff um, for tying together lots of services from disparate sources, and it's it's quite it's quite nice. It's got a very sort of JSON-like uh, structure. You can define the um, shape of the response that you want to get, or the JSON response you want to get, and you can query, if you specify the data sources a bit, you can query that. Um, oh, yeah, so we've got here um, some, some information about how that, how GraphQL can, um, uh, what's the word, make itself discoverable. Um, the microservices themselves should be discoverable as well, using the um, HTRS, which is hypertext as a, um, as the engine of an application state. And a GraphQL query might look kind of quite nice like that. And it could be quite a small portable query that could be relatively um, implement implementation um, independent of the underlying technology. But the next bit is the linked data bits. Now, GraphQL uh, microservices and so on, um, or 
the microservices that GraphQL uh, talks to would typically not have um, really necessarily been link used linked data, or if they did, it would have surfaced that linked data in a way that was um, probably purely JSON and would have to be integrated by you or the developer in the API layer, which again isn't particularly sort of great. Um, you might have to have an API layer on top of something that was talking to GraphQL. It's not sort of, it's a bit of a messy kind of interim solution. Um, similarly, um, the reason I popped this up, um, this is for query federation in Sparkle. One of the things that you might often want to do is from one, um, one, one service, you might want to query several, um, several different resources. And there are, there, are, there are ways of doing this in, in Sparkle, which are kind of, you know, it's, it's a way of doing it, but it is flawed in lots of ways, particularly around things like security, actually. Um, these days, not that many people want to have a completely open Sparkle endpoint. Uh, it's, you know, you wouldn't have a, an open SQL endpoint, probably. Um, and there are lots and lots of good architectural reasons not to have a Sparkle endpoint. For a start, if someone sends a massively complicated regu regular expression query to your uh, data store, they can sort of very quickly cause a denial of service on your, on your precious public data. Um, but also, I mean, okay, the silent keyword in here will kind of prove, kind of protect a bit against that service going down, but what you kind of want to do is you want to sort of isolate yourself a bit away from um, lack of availability of other services and so on. So what we've looked at with that is, okay, so this is looking at, um, again, a single API layer talking <coughs> to a single triple store, which is kind of quite similar to the model that a lot of um, the semantic web world has been at for quite a long time. Um, you could argue that the web app layer separate from the API layer is actually a sort of bit of a departure in that because a lot of the um, semantic web applications that we've uh, seen um, have been very much kind of everything bundled together and not very much separation in there. Um, and what we wanted to do was um, enable, um, I don't know what's going on there, yeah, uh, enable a degree of separation uh, between the microservice and the APIs, and, uh, sorry, between the semantic web data, the semantic web data in triple store, and the uh, API data itself. Um, so along this point, along this sort of uh, approach, you might have several microservices all looking at the same triple store, maybe with a different, from a different um, angle. Some of them are querying person data, some of them are querying company data, some of them are querying, I don't know, um, educational details data, or something like that. So each of those is a single, uh, a single responsibility. This tends to blur in practice. Um, you know, it seems to be very, very difficult to get people to actually keep single responsibility services in, in practice because the responsibilities grow and grow and the lines between those microservices get blurred and blurred and blurred as time goes on. Um, usually as management starts to kind of um, request additional bits and pieces and no one has time to uh, actually do anything nice about it. So there's one solution which would be to have each microservice talking to a separate uh, data store. It's, uh, you know, Having, having, a, having microservices talking to uh, contained storage is sort of quite a understood and um, you know, normal model. But then you end up with a dependency problem just the same, that querying this microservice and querying that microservice, if you want to marry this, the data of the two together, you've got to do it in the API layer because there's no other way of doing that. Um, and so normally you'd be able to put something like GraphQL in there but if the data you're getting, getting back is in RDF format, then yeah, that's not necessarily very easily sort of manageable within um, from GraphQL. So we built this um, application called HyperGraphQL, and it is an application at the moment. It uh, runs as a fairly lightweight server, um, and you can configure it to talk to one or more data stores, and it will return data in sort of JSON-LD minus, I would probably call it. Um, it's, JSON-LD in its purest form isn't very much um, enjoyed by uh, GraphQL. Um, and so we, we, we kind of take a slight shortcut on it, but it's still, 
pretty much JSON-LD and can be converted to JSON-LD very, very simply. Um, but the advantage of that is that we can now use our data, we can query it um, through our web layer very, very, in a very, very lightweight fashion. Um, we can create particularly sort of useful, fairly standard uh, language of query, which does get translated down to Sparkle in the end. Um, at the moment, I'm just looking at some of the bullet points on here that we've got, um, but it's currently looked, it can look at Sparkle endpoints, it can look at um, flat files of Turtle, of um, RDFXML, of um, NQuads. There are various types of things it can look at and work with and you know, treat as though they're, they're sort of uh, native um, data formats. One of the other things it can look at as well is additional HypergraphQL servers. And that's where the hypergraph bit sort of comes from. Okay. So in this particular example, we have, um, this is sort of close to one of our clients actually, who is uh, in the life sciences um, arena. Um, so we have a UN uh, FAO um, on data set down at the bottom there. And we have AgroVoc, which is a agricultural vocabulary, surprisingly, and DBpedia. And what this diagram kind of shows is that um, we have a single HypergraphQL instance stitched together from a HypergraphQL instance which stitches together DBpedia and something which services, uh, services the this FAO uh, document. The idea being that the actual source beyond about here should be completely um, opaque to the, um, the, the HypergraphQL instance at the front. Um, here's a slightly more kind of, yeah, here's another example of stuff you could do with it, which is a, sli a slightly bigger network. We could increase the size of this network quite a lot. Um, I think, you know, at the moment, our the hypergraph engine can only talk to other hypergraph engines, flat RDF files, or triple stores. And we would like to sort of further this on um, to it so we can talk to things like um, maybe someone could write a SQL driver for it. Maybe someone could write a Gremlin driver for it. There are quite a lot of possibilities for things that people could do to make this as a useful thing. But the reason that this has grown like it has has been to address specific use cases that we had. And we unfortunately don't have the time and resource to put more energy into developing bespoke things for other people. Now, one of the things that um, I actually listening to Ruben this morning, um, one of the things that very, very easy to use this for would be as a lightweight mechanism for pulling together, say, personal pod data, um, where each of these endpoints could point to, um, you know, to the chair there, um, could point to, say, a scheduling uh, service, it could point to a, um, a photo, photo store service, it could point to a social media feed, um, and, put, and allow this information to be queried and surfaced in a fairly sort of simple and um, monoblocks kind of way. Um, so the sort of queries that this would give you, if I can find out a bit, yeah, there we go, is um, this is pretty much a query, a GraphQL query, um, and a HyperGraphQL query, where we're basically saying, give me six people from the first person, it's, very, it's, it's pretty straightforward, I think. It's, um, the, we basically list the fields, we list um, some subobjects, we list some restrictions, so that, for example, the labels for all these must only be in English. I'm not interested in the, um, the, um, I don't know, the Arabic um, name of, the, of, a, of someone's birthplace, if it's in Arabic, but, yeah. Where is the sort clause? There isn't one at the moment. But you know that Sparkle defines uh, yes. asset and limits as undefined behavior if you don't have a sorting clause. Yes. Um, at the moment, the sorting clause is implicit based on, um, I think, based on name. Um, we are aware that there's quite a few other things like that that do need to be, you know, quite a few other language uh, constraints that we need to want to put in place. Um, and you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're aware that we haven't had a chance to sort of put a lot of these in. Sorting wasn't specifically um, a useful thing for, um, for the actual case we were using, but it's something that clearly yeah. we want to try and uh, implement. Um, 
So that largely is is what we've been doing with HyperGraphQL, really. Um, yeah, what else is there to say? Um, I have a question. So, do you have just one resolver written that takes this and converts it into a, a uh, statement, or do you have to write multiple resolvers? Well, we've currently got two. We've currently got two resolvers in place. Uh, one which will um, convert um, the query language into Sparkle, right. and one which will convert the query language into the query language, which might seem obtuse, but it's um, if we're passing that data on to another to further services, we, we kind of need to do that. Right, so, so the question I'm having is, do you have a people resolver in this example? Um, I do. Um, <laughs> let me find you a... We can talk about this offline a little bit. Yeah, well, I, after, afterwards I was going to show you some, some uh, real life um, okay. demo stuff, if that's... Uh, there we go. That. There's, 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 some, there's some code here. Um, <laughs> That's what you wanted to see, isn't it? You wanted to see the code. <laughs> it's, it's actually really working. Um, and I, I, I tried to demonstrate this the other day by turning off the wireless network, but found that my um, the screen was actually connected by wireless as well, which kind of meant that people had actually the same word for it. Um, what we've got in some of this, actually the reason I've got this up is so that you can see some of the the sort of information that from the resolver kind of, <coughs> and what we've got in here, we've got some specific IRIs which look at, so in this particular case, uh, some SCOS and some DVpedia um, descriptions. So then we can actually sort of describe how those services are resolved and how they're built and what they actually mean so that people can define, define the language. Um, and within here as well, we have a configuration which says, okay, this is a particular service and it's composed of these services or these things. And in this case, we've got a, a file path, a, um, and a couple of other HyperGraphQL instances running somewhere. Um, they happen to be local at the moment, but there's no need, reason they need to be. And if we're talking to remote services, we can pass in usernames and passwords, because you know, surprisingly, people are precious about the data and kind of maybe want to keep track of who accesses what and, and so on. Um, <coughs> Also, we've had this running now quite happily on um, AWS instances as a, an Elastic Beanstalk application. Um, it's deployable as a web application as well. And the configuration can be read from, actually it's sort of going in along with the um, Elastic Beanstalk um, sort of mindset. Um, configuration can be read from uh, Amazon S3, or it can be read from an arbitrary URL, and it can, but doesn't have to require a username and password for that configuration too. Um, so yeah, we want, one of the things that we would like to do would be to make it so that we have an endpoint where we can expose this, so that if you're kind of yeah, because there's there's a, there's a lot of bootstrapping in the beginning, right? So that's right. I mean, that's I think that that's 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 part of the thing. In order to make it simple to work with, once yeah. it's uh, up and running, we've kind of got the you've got the the overhead somewhere. Yeah. Um, so rather rather than give people a huge great sort of overhead of um, of Sparkle to uh, Work with. So we've got some got some examples of some various bits and pieces running on one of our servers at the moment. Let's see. There's a simple. We played with SSL, or someone played with SSL last night, and um, it's kind of caused lots of small issues with this, unfortunately, as is the way with demos. Um, so we have a straight query to something running on Wikipedia, um, looking at two specific countries. Trying to find Afghanistan, I owe those. Um, and we've got some results in JSON. And you can see it's, it's sort of JSON LD in that it's. It is JSON LD. Um, we have another thing which is looking just at a flat file, which I'll bring back fairly quickly. Um, it's quite a big file. Um, and then we have one which marrows, mar marrows, mar marries the two together. So we have um, DVpedia, we have a flat file um, which is on a remote service, and we have a flat file which is on another remote, so, sorry. My mistake, we're looking at a flat file, we're looking at another flat file as a remote service, and we're looking at DVpedia. And so what we're saying here is, based on configuration which looks like Looks like this one, I think. Is it? No. So based on these, 
this configuration and this schema definition where we've actually specified these things are from Wikipedia, these things are from a local file. This is what you this is how to pull these services together. Um, you get a fairly tightly constrained, it is fairly tightly constrained in that uh, people can't go and query arbitrarily anything. They can only query things at the same level as the service, as the, as the sort of highest service is exposed. Um, I think if people wanted to, if there was a sort of great call for making the lower services exposed in the same way, then we could do that. Um, I don't think that would be a problem. But what this is doing, um, I'll come in again just to show you, but there we go. It's pulling together um, all the information from this FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization um, database, um, and adding that to, adding, augmenting that with what's in BDpedia, and augmenting that with what's in the yeah, this agricultural uh, recovery file, which is basically just saying that it's in southwestern Asia. Um, so that's largely what we're doing with that. And I can give you, if people are really interested, then I can um, um, come up with, you know, show you some running examples on my laptop um, and have a play around with some of that. Um, but I think that's largely it. Now, I was going to sort of give a slightly different talk today, but having heard Ruben's talk this morning, I kind of like, well, you know what, well, I kind of, you know, going to go down this direction a little bit more. Um, so it might be a bit more kind of bust freestyle than uh, I was intending, but <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, come on. Any questions? <laughs> I have two. Um, so first, um, some of the examples you showed when you ran them, uh, you would have like property capital and then you would return a list of objects.